ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this afternoon session is truly a session which is meant to be interactive. And we have an exciting group of panelists, but actually the panel is not only four people, the panel is about 1,200 thick. Each and every one of you is a panelist. And my co-moderator will not be shy in calling upon any one of you to opine on an issue if he so wishes. Uh, this is a, folks sit down please. Uh, this is a panel where we are going to pose uh, through patient presentations, day-to-day -day issues which uh, plague the people who practice thyroid surgery, thyroid cancer surgery, and particularly for the young and the somewhat less familiar with thyroid disease uh, have difficulty in making day-to-day -day decisions. Uh, these are not rare cases. These are not going to be very complex, difficult problems. But these are issues where there are perennial problems where you need to hear from the experts. Uh, so I'm going to turn the podium over to my co-moderator, a more learned and more intelligent man than I am, Brian McIver, who has taught me much of thyroid endocrinology and gave me some more senses in there. Brian? Well, thank you, Jay, and thank you to the organizers, and thank you to the audience in this huge room. Uh, it's a real pleasure to see this room, although not wall-to-wall uh, -wall packed, at least very well attended, um, because I do, of course, believe that thyroid cancer is the most important of the head and neck diseases, uh, so I'm pleased to see that you all agree with me. The format of this afternoon is supposed to be a thyroid tumor board, and a tumor board is not something that I was used to participating in at Mayo Clinic, where I trained previously. But having moved a year ago to the Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, Florida, uh, tumor boards are part of the ethos of the cancer center. And so I've been an active participant and leader of the tumor board down at Moffitt over the course of the last year. And I have to tell you, it's the most invigorating thing I've done in endocrinology in many a long year. We sit down with an endocrinologist group, a group of head and neck surgeons, medical oncology, radiation oncology, pathology, and radiology, and it is exciting and invigorating, and there are strong opinions flying everywhere. And in thyroid disease, as you know, an absence of good data often drives very strong opinions uh, on both sides of every debate that we have. And I expect this afternoon to be no different. I expect our panelists to be very interactive. If they fail to be interactive, we have Dr. Shah here to encourage, whip, and enthuse the participants. But in addition, as audience members, please do, if there's a burning issue that you simply must speak out about, please uh, stand up and make yourself known, and we will listen to your questions. Our panelists today, uh, you already know uh, me uh, and Dr. Shah, of course. Uh, we also have Dr. Robert Ferris from UPMC in Pittsburgh, Dr. Otsuki from Kobe University in Kobe, Japan, uh, Dr. Lisa Orloff from UCSF in San Francisco, and Dr. Owane Koko from Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. And every one of these individuals is highly experienced in the field of thyroid cancer in some aspect of it, and I'm here hoping to learn from each of you. Uh, conflicts and dualities of interest, I'm aware of none, but the panelists will let you know if they do have any that have not been declared up to now. I'm the only person who seems to have any conflicts here, and I should let you know that I have done consulting work for Verisite, Asurogen, and more recently CBL Path, uh, all of whom have an interest in molecular markers in the evaluation of thyroid nodules. And we will talk just very fleetingly about thyroid nodules on the way past. So onwards then with a case, uh, uh, I should mention all of these cases are real cases that I've seen at the Cancer Center over the course really of the last six months. Uh, so these are standard cases that you and I might come across every single day. She's a 32-year-old woman with an incidentally discovered three-centimeter thyroid nodule clinically. She has no prior history of radiation and there's no family history of thyroid cancer. So as a nice gentle introduction, uh, Dr. Ferris, how would you like to approach this problem? Uh, well, I gather this is palpable uh, at three centimeters, and that's what brought uh, it to medical attention. Uh, oftentimes, when they're not quite this large, the patient comes in with an ultrasound from the outside. Uh, but in a setting like this, I would always want to have an ultrasound, and uh, even one with one from the outside would repeat one uh, by an experienced thyroid ultrasonographer 
uh, who can uh, articulate in a report the important features that we would want to know regarding uh, risk factors for thyroid cancer. Any other testing you might biopsy. want to do before doing the ultrasound? I'd certainly palpate her uh, neck, uh, feel it. Is it firm? Uh, is she talk to her? Does she have a good voice? Uh, are there any features in the history that are of concern? Anyone else from the panel like to do anything else other than the ultrasound? Straight to biopsy, perhaps? Well, it may also be uh, good to know whether or not this is a functional nodule or not. So <laughs> getting a TSH may be helpful. Yeah, so a TSH measurement is typically the first step in the evaluation. But why is that? Why do we not just go straight to ultrasound and biopsy? Why do we measure a TSH? What difference does it make? It's a three centimeter nodule. Surely we need to know pathology. Lisa. In the real world, we're doing these things simultaneously, doing a physical and a history and physical, of course, always first, ordering blood tests. Uh, part of the physical exam should always include a preoperative, uh, pre uh, decision making laryngoscopy, as well as palpation of the entire neck. And um, in terms of the TSH, you want to know if it's either high or low. Uh, because that has implications on the likelihood of malignancy and the behavior of malignancy. So if the TSH is low, Dr. Orloff, um, what are you going to do about this nodule? Still want the biopsy? So I would still want a biopsy. I have personally, I don't think I've ever in my career ordered a thyroid scan because it's usually done by my colleagues in endocrinology. But uh, I know that somebody like this, if she had a low TSH, might be a candidate for a thyroid scan. But I would still want a biopsy in spite of the fact that an uh, uh, autonomously functioning nodule is not likely to be malignant, it still can be malignant, and a three centimeter nodule, I think, warrants a biopsy. Yeah, so I mean, I think this is a legitimate source of concern amongst surgeons that big nodules might be cancer, and therefore we should definitely follow it as if it was a cold nodule, even when it's a hot nodule. But the rationale for not doing an FNA biopsy on a hot nodule is based more than just on the issue of the um, likelihood of malignancy. It's also based on the likelihood of a false positive biopsy. Um, so, uh, Dr. Shah, have you any comments on, in Memorial, if you do a biopsy on a hot nodule, what do you find? I think uh, <clears throat> biopsy on a hot nodule, uh, will, the yield of finding cancer is going to be low, but it's not zero. So keep in mind that if your thyroid scan shows a functioning nodule and the TSH is low, the likelihood of finding cancer is low, but it's not zero. From your previous institution at Mayo Clinic, uh, there is a report by Bears and uh, G.B. Chong on papillary carcinoma in hot nodules. And that, if my memory serves me correct, that incidence was about three to three and a half percent. Correct me if I'm wrong. I believe that's correct. So I think, you know, you need to not just rely on TSH and the thyroid scan, I rarely, Lisa, I agree with you, I don't think I've ordered a thyroid scan in probably 30 years. Uh, I think it's a, it's a, and again, I hasten to say, but it's an archaic test. It gives you very little information. It shows you whether it's a white blob or a black blob, but it, <laughs> but it doesn't tell you anything more than that. Uh, so if, if your TSH is low, yes, it is, a, a, I would more, rely more on the uh, free T4, and patient symptoms of thyrotoxicosis rather than uh, worry about the thyroid scan findings. So you need to uh, take into account other features. Is it a solid nodule by palpation? Is it a hard nodule? Is it fixed? Is it mobile? So I think uh, those features will lead me to go to do a needle biopsy even in the presence of a functioning nodule. So this is very interesting because this panel is very much taking the line that many of my surgical colleagues at Moffat take as well, but they go in direct uh, conflict with the recommendations from the American Thyroid Association and the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists who say if you have a hot nodule, in other words, a suppressed TSH and the scan, isotope scan shows hot, you should not do a biopsy because of the very high false uh, positive rate, you find a lot of follicular neoplasms that then commits you to a surgical approach. Now, my argument as well is a three centimeter nodule may well be best managed with a surgical approach even if it is hot. But I think we do have a challenge with FNA biopsy in hot nodules because they often come out as follicular neoplasms. This is the nature of the nodule. Um, how about some comments from the panel uh, about this hot nodule? Sorry about this not hot nodule, I apologize. Our TSH was normal. 
Panelists, please speak up. Any one of you, just shout right out. Well, not being an, uh, a radiologist, I would uh, go out on a limb. Um, what we see here is um, a well-defined, well-circumscribed, but complex appearing nodule uh, with um, um, scepter in the within the nodule cavity is cystic. Uh, you do have some solid components within within the nodule as well. Cool. So, cancer or not cancer? <laughs> <laughs> well, I do not see any. Uh, well. We do not have the full ultrasonography feature, so we do not have the blood flow pattern and things like that, but I don't see any evidence for microcalcifications. Uh, but I think it doesn't appear malignant. It's so what, so what you're, what what you're telling us is it's a lump, <laughs> which the patient came in telling us we had. Now we've yes. gone through two lines of testing and we still just have a lump. Okay, what would you like to do about that lump? Yeah. And this uh, follicular neoplasm, I think, uh, but uh, I can't mm, define the benign or malignant. It's very, dif um, very uh, difficult to uh, the only U.S. So, so would you like to do a biopsy of this nodule? Does it meet your so criteria? I try. Uh, biopsy uh, and the uh, uh, fine needle and biopsy and the uh, US guided. Okay, so fine needle aspiration biopsy. I think ATA at least says for a benign appearing nodule, if that's what we think it is, if the nodule is greater than two centimeters, we should certainly biopsy it anyway, just to prove that it is indeed benign. Um, Actually, it didn't turn out that way though, because her fine needle biopsy was suspicious for herthal cell neoplasm. Um, and in Florida, the Affirma assay is in widespread use. This is a, a, a gene expression classifier to try to reclassify indeterminate nodules in, into either benign or suspicious. And in this case, the assay returned suspicious. Uh, the ultrasound scan of the neck was negative. Uh, incidentally noted was an ipsilateral, just over one centimeter second nodule within that lobe. Uh, which had non-specific characteristics and was also defined as indeterminate. So uh, from a surgical perspective, what comes next? Are you ready to take this thing out? And if so, uh, what are you going to take out? So let's just take it from the far end to the close end and we'll just address these questions. Dr. Barrett. Uh, so the uh, positive predictive value of, uh, of, of the Affirma suspicious uh, was actually not that high. Uh, the main value of the Affirma test is its negative predictive value. So uh, in a sense, the test here didn't help so much because you have a cytologic diagnosis, <clears throat> which is indeterminate, has a risk of 20 to 30 percent malignancy in that, uh, and I'd say most practices would lead to a lobectomy in the absence of other clinical or features such as hypothyroidism or contralateral nodules and so on, family history of uh, thyroid cancer, radiation, and so on. So in this setting, without any of those uh, adjunctive reasons for more than a lobectomy, this patient, uh, in, uh, if presented to me, we wouldn't get the Affirma test. Uh, I can tell you about the Pittsburgh test, but uh, with the Affirma test, I would say we're still back at the same lobectomy that the cytologic diagnosis would have uh, indicated. Okay, and any disagreement uh, on the panel to a lobectomy as the next step in this patient's evaluation? I don't disagree. I, I agree completely, except that when I get a Herthel cell uh, dominant type of FNA, I think it's helpful to get a thyroid peroxidase antibody. And this snippet of ultrasound that you showed us did not look like a patient with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, but I think that uh, sometimes there are patients with thyroiditis, and that can lead to a, a, uh, an interpretation on cytology of Herthel cells when it really isn't a neoplasm. Right, and I think that the presence of underlying autoimmune thyroid disease is a confounder in cytopathology because Herthel cells are very common in that setting. Um, and in that setting, the 
the likelihood of malignancy may not be as high as the 30% we were mentioning earlier. It may actually be somewhat lower simply because there are herfal cells in the nodule. But nonetheless, cytopathology and molecular markers probably are not going to be enough to avoid a surgery. Just to clear the air and be sure, is there anybody here who would prefer to do a total thyroidectomy for this patient with a three centimeter and a 1.1 centimeter indeterminate right thyroid nodule? I'll take that as a consensus. no. No, we have consensus, surgical consensus. I, I, I like would it. just like to know if anybody's ever seen a Herthel cell carcinoma in a 30-year-old woman. That's a good question. Has anybody in the audience seen a Herthel cell cancer in a 30-year-old woman? I think she was 32, actually. Oh, sorry, 32. Yeah, yeah it happens. It it's uncommon, but it can rarely happen. And I've seen a small smattering of such tumors myself. So she had a lobectomy, and frozen section said follicular lesion with Herthel cell features. So frozen section, <coughs> useful in your practice or not useful in your practice for these Herthel cell lesions? I, I, I almost never freeze thyroid nodule. Okay. Uh, Dr. Shah at Memorial? Uh, I think f uh, for whatever action you take in surgery, you must have a good reason why you are doing it. If the frozen section is going to change the course of the operation, then you should do it. The frozen section report is not going to alter your decision, then that's an unnecessary expense, an exhibition of your ignorance about the need for the test. I'm sorry, but I, I'm a bit harsh, but that's true. <laughs> because frozen sections are being sent knowing that this is a follicular lesion, knowing that the pathologist is not going to tell you whether this is low grade follicular carcinoma or in adenoma. So what are you looking for on frozen section? Now, if you argue that I'm looking for medullary carcinoma, I would say do it. But then you don't need frozen section. You should have done the blood test before the operation. Mm -hmm. So often these days the pathologists are doing touch preps, which are useful in the diagnosis of follicular variant papillary in some cases. Uh, so that might be one reason to do an immediate assessment. Frozen section itself outside of Mayo Clinic seems to have a very uh, poor reputation. <coughs> And the primary reason for doing frozen section at Mayo, I think, is just because that's what we do with everything uh, that comes out of the body at Mayo. Everybody gets a frozen section on everything. Um, our use of it at Moffat is uh, rather more selective, as I think you're suggesting. Final pathology confirmed a benign 3.5 centimeter Herthel cell neoplasm, but no signs of capsular or vascular invasion, well encapsulated benign nodule. But you may remember there was a 1.1 centimeter second nodule, and it turned out to be a 1.3 centimeter follicular variant papillary thyroid cancer. Okay, so now we've got an incidental discovery of this T1B, presumed N0 because the preoperative ultrasound was negative, uh, M unknown follicular variant papillary cancer in a 32-year-old woman. Okay. So, how would you move forward? Who on the panel, just a show of hands, who would do completion thyroidectomy? I, I think that uh, it's one of those discussions that is taking up more and more time in our clinics, uh, this kind of case. Uh, I think uh, if this patient isn't aware of the options, they very well may find uh, another surgeon who tells them that you didn't offer that and so I think it takes a, a lengthy discussion explaining the advantages and disadvantages of a completion thyroidectomy and there are disadvantages. Uh, it's not a benign procedure and uh, it's not clear that uh, you can demonstrate any benefit from it. So, so educate me because I'm not a surgeon. Um, you've done a lobectomy. You've entered the ipsilateral compartment to this tumor that was discovered to be a, fo a follicular variant papillary. Presumably, the contralateral compartment is a virgin compartment. You already know that the nerve is intact from the first side, presumably. Uh, you already know the status of the parathyroids on the first side. So isn't a completion thyroidectomy actually safer than a de novo total thyroidectomy, where you wouldn't know the status of each nerve and you wouldn't know necessarily the status of the parathyroids until you've done it? Simply, uh, you didn't mention in the pathology, but simply because they don't appear on the pathology report does not mean that they're well vascularized. That would be the first point. Uh, the second is that there, there is scar tissue in the central uh, paratracheal, uh, pretracheal area prior to uh, uh, encountering the virgin, so-called virgin area you pointed out. Nonetheless, it's a procedure the patient may not need. I think that's the major 
risk of it, not in comparison to the upfront lobectomy, uh, but can you demonstrate any benefit to the patient? And you, you can from the standpoint of a, uh, the ability to use uh, an annual thyroglobulin uh, and, and so on. Uh, you know, so you certainly will clarify for this patient uh, the disease status of the contralateral lobe. So this young woman is a, 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 a member of the Air Force. Uh, we have a big Naval and Air Force base in Tampa. And she's a member of the Air Force, and she is used to taking orders. And the first thing she says when she's asked the question about the completion is, I will do whatever you say, sir. What would you recommend to her? <laughs> I think what, sorry. No, please, I think yeah. as part of the discussion, one information that will be critical, because if you decide not to do the completion thyroidectomy, you are also leaning towards doing something instead of that, which would be the RA eye ablation, presumably. Then the question to ask is, given that this is a young lady, we don't know what uh, the family status is, what her wishes are for pregnancy down the line. Uh, while it is not absolute that the patient treated with RAI would become amenorrheic, there is some considerable risk that that could happen. And I think that should come into the discussion as to what the optimal option would be for these patients. Yeah. We don't have a, a real endocrinologist on the panel, so I'm going to act as the uh, panelist endocrinologist, if that's okay. Uh, and I would say most of us would say that radioactive iodine is a poor substitute for surgery for completion thyroidectomy, requiring often multiple doses to ablate that remnant, and often with an incomplete ablation at the end of the day, requiring cumulatively large doses. So if I'm the endocrinologist seeing this patient, and I think she needs a completion, she's coming back to you, I'm not going to be doing that completion using RAI. But you do bring up an important point, uh, the first, uh, as you said, being that um, I would not treat with REI in the absence of, uh, of uh, an attempted total thyroidectomy, but, uh, or completion in this case, but a, an important point to this case is to, is to have a relationship with your endocrinologist that you know what they're going to be telling the patient with this diagnosis so that you present a united message and not confuse the patient. So anybody on the panel who's coming down hard towards a completion thyroidectomy, given that the patient is neutral on this? I would just like to back up to the um, prior discussion about frozen section, as well as the, I would take issue with the staging of this lesion as a T1 N0 if there were no nodes sampled at the time of the prior surgery. When I went in to operate on this woman for a Herthel cell lesion, I didn't want to have to go back into that compartment at a later date, so I would have sampled lymph nodes if I could find any, and that would have given me information on both the Herthel cell and the possible existence of metastatic papillary carcinoma at the time. So I would have liked to know what the actual pathologic nodal status of the, the original um, thyroid uh, lobectomy side was. So the, uh, there was one node that came out with that lobe, and it was node negative. Uh, so, cancer. and that sort of points out the, the, the shortcomings of our staging system that with one single node you have a, a pathologic stage N0 which may not be reflective of the rest of the nodes in the area, but if as the surgeon in that uh, original case you had at least inspected that ipsilateral side um, and confirmed that there were no other prominent lymph nodes, then I think that that's at least more supportive of this being a, a case of papillary carcinoma that's not metastatic to the highest risk area, which is the ipsilateral uh, central neck. So we're going to talk a little bit more about central neck node management in the next case. Um, so we'll skip on there. Anybody here on the panel willing to say this patient does not need the completion? She had a 1.3 centimeter. She's T1. She's a young patient. She's going to live forever. Why on earth are we going to go ahead and take out that other lobe? Dr. Shah, I know I can call on you to be a minimalist. You know, there is a saying in medicine which is called primum non nocere, do no harm to the patient. This patient is cured, and you can't cure her more than 100%. Whether you do total thyroidectomy, you do total thyroidectomy and give radioactive iodine, you do elective central compartment dissection or elective lateral neck dissection, it's not going to improve the longevity of this patient. So doing more, you have to convince me that completion thyroidectomy, completion thyroidectomy and radioactive iodine or elective node dissection has any statistical data supporting your recommendation. If you do not have statistics to support your contention, 
then I think we are talking about personal biases which should not apply into a forum like this. But Dr. Shah, when did you ever see any statistics in thyroid cancer that were meaningful? Uh, there is plenty of statistics, and there are very few meaningful statistics. And you will never find a prospective randomized trial because the biology of the disease is such that all of us will be long gone before you report a 20 or a 30 year survivorship and recurrence free survivorship in a 32 year old woman. So would you treat her with thyroid hormone suppressive therapy with that? That is a very there? provocative question. Uh, does this woman need to be suppressed? Mind you, she's 32 and she's going to live at least another 60 years of her life. She will get older and she will get osteoporotic and do you want to precipitate her osteoporosis by keeping her TSH down to zero? And there are some enthusiasts to keep the TSH to zero. So I think I would get a baseline TSH perhaps two months out. I'm not in no rush to put the patient on suppression the week after thyroidectomy. I'm not aware of any data which says that if you don't suppress within one week of thyroidectomy, the patient will die. No such thing exists. And if you, if you do immediate post-op TSH, it's going to be elevated. You just took out a part of the thyroid gland. It takes that information some time to get to the brain to affect on TSH. So two months out, I'll do TSH. If the TSH is elevated or on the high range of normal, I may think about suppression. If it is one or around, I will put, not put her on thyroid suppression. So um, are you going to treat her just to normalize her TSH, or will you suppress her if you treat her with thyroid hormone? Well, I think that is a question uh, which is debatable. The, again, there is no data to show that suppression of TSH to 1, 0 0.9, 0 0.05, or 0.04 has any statistical validity that higher suppression means better uh, pa patient care or better survivorship. All right, so we're going to take a vote from the panel first. Who on the panel then is going to be comfortable with a lobectomy alone? I think the surgeons okay. are. <laughs> yeah, okay, and let's just take a brief poll from the audience. Is there anybody in the audience who feels strongly that this patient really should have the total thyroidectomy, the completion thyroidectomy? So we've got a few people who really do feel, maybe a dozen or 20 people who really feel that thyroidectomy is necessary. How about a show of hands who would say a lobectomy is sufficient? Well, the majority of the audience would say lobectomy. I can tell you that amongst an endocrinology audience, this case would raise probably 95% of people's hands saying, let's get rid of that other half, because otherwise, how do I monitor this patient into the future? So let's take this minimalist audience and uh, ask the question, would it matter to you if those surgical margins were microscopically positive? <laughs> well, this is one of those th with that she would then be a T3. And that would put her in a category where she's a candidate well, for if, if I can interrupt a second, it wouldn't necessarily make her T3. Only surgical margins are positive. You're assuming ah, that the entire thyroid, thyroid has been removed. So you could have a T1 that has positive surgical margins. It would be hard to envision that, but usually those two go together. But that would raise my concern for whether this patient needs the adjuvant RAI, at which point the completion thyroidectomy would be part of that package. Okay, and the rest of the panel, any uh, still want to stick with the lobectomy alone? Um, I do, I, Dr. Shah, <laughs> Okay, justified. so I think you know, the, the, the most important part of this patient's care is educating the patient about the biology of her cancer. Needless to say, this patient will go and seek many consultations. She will get confused with a diversity of opinions, and then she'll come back to you that Dr. Ferris says thyroidectomy and radioiodine. Dr. Orloff says thyroidectomy and elective node. Guys, don't take it personally. <laughs> elective node dissection and what have you. So I think your first or second post-operative visit is going to be the longest one because you are now telling the patient that this cancer is symbiotic with you. Presence of microscopic cancer doesn't mean anything. I can prove microscopic cancer even in your lateral neck node if I do elective neck dissection of the whole neck, there is a 50% probability that you will have micrometastasis. And all of this means very little. And it takes time for the patient to understand the biology of this disease. But once they do, they are in sync with you. This patient will be coming to see you once a year for the rest of her and your life, and you, your discussion at that time will be 
mostly social, how our family is doing. So you're going to leave this uh, residual cancer in the neck. Well, Are there I other panelists happy with that approach? First of all, I, you know, at the time of surgery, you should have uh, put your cross clamp away from the nodule so that you don't get this scenario. But assuming that this was done elsewhere, then you need to go back to pathology and have pull out the specimen, how microscopically positive it is. If there is gross transaction through tumor and the cut margin shows the tumor throughout up and down, then I will have to take her back to the operating room. If I see a focal microscopic area of papillary carcinoma, that's fine. I'm not worried about it. Focal microscopic. Rest of the panel happy to leave it behind, or do people want to be a bit more aggressive? I think if you go by the eight, <coughs> excuse me, if you go by the ATA guideline, um, this patient will fall. You know, going back to what uh, Dr. Ferris was alluding to, assuming that this is true extrathyroidal extension, but not uh, just positive uh, surgical margin. You're now talking of someone in intermediate to high risk category. But if we're only saying that this is microscopically positive, we don't know how it got there, and it may not be that you actually left tumor behind, then you have a lot of discussion to hold with the patient. And that would actually be a patient where you are thinking of maybe following the guideline of low normal TSH suppression. I but, know Dr. Shah would not. But, uh, isn't, but isn't it the case that your endocrinologist with whom you work closely is going to freak out if you don't do something That's exactly more? what I'm saying, that the <laughs> endocrinologist in this instance will not be comfortable saying, we're not going to do anything, you're fine. Yeah. And I think the multidisciplinary approach will actually help the patient to reach the most uh, appropriate decision going forward. <clears throat> Well, not only were her surgical margins microscopically positive, but she also has a BRAF V600E mutation, which we didn't know about ahead of time, but it was tested on the sample subsequently. Um, so, Dr. Ferris, you're still leaving that cancer behind? I'm just, my heart sunk, <laughs> because we could have packaged up this patient's entire surgical therapy with her upfront total thyroidectomy with the uh, Nikki Forov panel, we would have not had any frozen section. We would have saved but the healthcare system. But remember that we didn't biopsy the cancer. We biopsied the benign nodule, so oh, we would have been right no further that. ahead. Fair enough. Well, I, I do think there's a question as to whether on the histopathology there's any value for doing molecular testing. I think there's a, a real stretch besides curiosity and research, but doing it after the fact, uh, given that particularly I think is the point of this uh, bullet point is to raise the question about the prognostic value of this uh, common mutation, which is, I'd say, relatively controversial at present, particularly in the absence of other histopathologic features which we already know have prognostic right. variables. So how about in Kobe, Japan? Would we uh, be following the same path or would we have a different strategy in Japan? Uh, so, uh, in this case, um, uh, T1, N0, N0. So, I recommend the uh, uh, lobectomy. So, this is uh, surgical margin positive, mean uh, external thyroidal extension. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, microscopically positive. So, and the uh, prognosis is not change. So, I observe uh, alone. You would observe alone and not complete the thyroidectomy or treat with radioactive iodine. So you would fit very much into Dr. Shah's approach. All right. Um, what happens if it's multifocal? <laughs> Dr. Orloff. Lisa, he's trying to corner you into <laughs> Getting tougher here. Um, I would agree with the uh, other panelists about the uh, BRAF mutation itself. Um, we did a study. I'm, I'm currently located at Stanford University, but while I was at UCSF, we did a review of our BRAF positive uh, histology and agree with uh, Bob's comment that um, it was present in the majority of our papillary carcinomas in the range of 80-plus uh, percent of the cases and um, really did not have... Um, a direct correlation with more ag aggressive behavior. Um, the additional foci does raise the question of if there are these microscopic foci that you saw, are there additional microscopic foci that you didn't see? And um, I have tended to rely on the three 
the rule of three microscopic foci as a <laughs> Well, she has three because there's a 1.3 exactly. centimeter, a two, and a so, three millimeter. So she would qualify as having three foci in this lobe, and therefore, um, and I'm sorry, I can't uh, recall the, the study that cited numbers of foci of microscopic disease, but uh, the, the rule of thumb that I followed is uh, three or more foci of disease uh, is more predictive of, of diffuse disease in the other lobe. So we, we looked at this at Mayo, I say we, it's really Ian Hay who looked at this at Mayo and demonstrated that multifocality uh, predicts more than anything else the uh, involvement of central compartment lymph nodes. And of course, central compartment lymph nodes then predict a higher risk for future recurrence of the disease, um, but didn't really impact on the long-term survival of these patients, which remains, of course, for normal life expectancy. But I think each of these uh, adverse impacts, including the finding of lymphovascular invasion on pathology, arguably raises the risk of this patient and I think pushes us more and more towards a completion. But I think this case more than anything illustrates why it's fascinating to be in a department of head and neck and endocrine oncology as I am, because the challenge with thyroid cancer is not that the disease is so aggressive and nasty as it is with most of the head and neck squames, but rather that it is so benign and innocuous, and you have to make these terribly tough decisions about how aggressive to make the treatment. And so we're balancing the risk and the benefit of surgery against the risk of the disease. Uh, so I find thyroid fascinating, as I say. So let's talk about a second case then. A 46-year-old woman, it's an incidentally discovered three centimeter nodule, so very similar to the last case, just a little older. No radiation history, no family history for thyroid cancer, no abnormalities of thyroid function. There's the nodule can on I, the ultrasound. Can I ask what her TSH was? TSH was 1.2. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so there is the uh, nodule, um, Dr. Ferris. This one looks uh, a little more irregular, looks more worrisome, certainly uh, less uh, well circumscribed, uh, has some, it's a little hard to tell from the projection whether those are cystic low density areas or just poor projection, but certainly looks like a solid nodule. That yeah, and on ultrasound real time, it was definitely a solid nodule, but with those hypoechoic areas within it, somewhat heterogeneous. Uh, blood flow pattern? Mm -hmm. So it contains blood flow, and uh, so it was felt to be at least a somewhat suspicious nodule. Uh, that's the biopsy material. I, I don't think you can see it all that well, but there are, there's nuclear clearing and prominent nucleoli and some irregularity in the shape of the nuclei. Uh, nuclear grooves are present as well. And so this was classified as Bethesda 6 uh, diagnostic for thyroid cancer uh, with papillary uh, features, so papillary thyroid cancer. Um, so Ultrasound scan was done preoperatively. No <coughs> lateral nodes were noted to be involved at the time. Uh, on then to management of the central neck in this case. Clearly, we're going to do a thyroidectomy. Um, I suppose I should ask first, is anybody on the panel going to do a lobectomy? Sure. Why not? Good. I'm glad. No, no. So, Wh what um, is, no, no. What is it in this patient that makes her a candidate for total thyroidectomy? Unless you tell me... She has gross extrathyroid extension, which matters. Unless you tell me this is poorly differentiated histology, that matters. <clears throat> or unless you tell me that the uh, tumor has invasion of central compartment viscera. Her age of 46 does not put her into the high risk category. And I think, uh, may, if you give me a moment. Please. I want to address the myth of 45 year age cutoff. That's why I made her 46. Uh, because there is nothing that happens me. on your 45th birthday that makes you high risk. So we have carefully looked at this and validated that from data from our institution, from Toronto, from MD Anderson, from Brazil, and from Australia. So there is a validation by five different institutions using uh, recursive partitioning uh, curves, ROC curves, to see where does the line for worsening of prognosis for recurrence and death due to cancer fall. That's not 45. That line actually drops at 56. And the recommendation to the AJCC, UICC staging committee in the coming year is going to shift the 
age cutoff line from 45 to 55. By doing that, we would be moving 17% of thyroid patients who get unnecessarily aggressive treatment because, because they just happen to be 46. So, so let me challenge you just a little, because here's a patient she's got, although these two dimensions are 2 and 1.5 centimeters in <coughs> longitudinal dimension, it's 3.2 centimeters. So this is going to be at least a T2 tumor. Correct. Um, a <coughs> large papillary of classic subtype is going to have lymph nodes involved in the central compartment in more than 60 to 70% of cases. So she's going to be a node positive T2, N1A at least, M unknown papillary cancer when you have resected this. And that is going to give her a stage probably uh, a three designation at a minimum. So now we're talking about a stage three cancer in this woman, and you're only going to do a lobectomy. So Let's you, take a poll of the audience you and tell wait, me. Wait, wait, before you take the poll. <laughs> you exactly enumerated the problem of the staging system. Because thyroid cancer is not like a pregnancy test. There are many gradations of thyroid cancer. So this patient will go to the operating room at my institution with the following consent. Right thyroid lobectomy, possible total thyroidectomy, possible central compartment dissection. Because those decisions are made intraoperatively. If she has no enlarged lymph nodes identified at the time of surgery, if she has no gross extrathyroid extension demonstrated at the time of surgery, there is no data that doing more than a lobectomy makes any difference. So let us then say you're going to do a lobectomy at this end of the table, a total thyroidectomy at the other end of the table, but both of you uh, would agree, I think, the central neck is very important. Dr. Shah, you would presumably do something in this ipsilateral central neck. Um, Dr. Ferris, I'm assuming you would do something in the bilateral central neck. What something no. would you do? No. We'll well, explore I, the central hold neck. On, hold on, hold okay. on. Let Dr. Ferris answer. I, I don't think... I don't think there's an indication for a bilateral central compartment dissection in this case, uh, unless you told me that it, the nodule was straight in the middle in the isthmus, for instance. But other than that, uh, I think a ipsilateral central compartment staging procedure is uh, reasonable. So how are you going to stage it? Are you going to ignore it? inspect it, dissect it, resect it? What exactly are you going to do surgically? Again, remind me, remember I'm an endocrinologist here. Mm -hmm. I think in simplistic terms. Uh, so, uh, if, if you're asking what, what is removed, are you saying to whether to, to make the decision to do so or not? Well, what I'm saying is you're going in to operate on this woman's thyroid. Mm -hmm. I presume you're going to do a removal of the thyroid and you will at least look into the central neck. Sure. And You'll I think Dr. Identify Shah, the nerve and those kind of things. Dr. Shah makes the point that we always inspect the central neck nodes, uh, and that would be one situation where a frozen section could be valuable uh, if there was something concerning or if there are features with regard to the gland itself, that lobe, uh, that looked worrisome and it looked more aggressive than the ultrasound uh, suggested. Uh, but I think in this case, I, I would say I would be leaning toward it. Leaning towards? Doing a central a peritracheal dissection on that side. So can you describe what you mean by a peritracheal dissection? What do you actually take out? Skeletonizing the nerve, removing the peritracheal, pretracheal, and, per and uh, paralaryngeal lymph nodes. And Dr. Orloff, is that what would happen in California? I wouldn't be satisfied. Just I, I, I have to put in a plug for a dynamic ultrasound because that ultrasound picture you showed us has other worrisome features. The tumor at, at least abuts the capsule laterally in the thyroid. It approaches the trachea immediately. It, uh, I, I think you would see um, lymph nodes in the central compartment in spite of what you read and hear about ultrasound being poor in the presence of the thyroid gland for the central neck. You can m most often see uh, macroscopic nodes in the central neck if you look for them. And so I think you would have a better sense preoperatively of whether there were bilateral or ipsilateral central nodes if you uh, did a more or you had a dynamic ultrasound to review. So depending on what that showed, I think I, I would most likely do an, at least an ipsilateral uh, central neck along the lines of what Dr. Ferris described, but uh, possibly bilateral if there were nodes on ultrasound bilaterally. So you would want to remove the node-bearing tissue or you would pluck out the nodes? No. Plucking is not in my vocabulary. <laughs> <laughs>
All right, and Dr. Uh, Dr. Shah, I presume you would say the same thing if there were visible nodes, you would visible do something about or them? Visible palpable, yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, what about this idea of a distinction between um, uh, central compartment dissection and central compartment resection, which in ICD-10 are going to be two different codes? What's the difference? Semantics. Semantics, yep. nothing other? So you do the same procedure? for those two codes? What do you code it as? I think, you know, we are, Brian, we need to clarify what does a central compartment lymph, lymph node dissection mean? And I would like to have the surgeons on the panel define when they do a central compartment dissection, what do they actually do? So there's the challenge to the surgeons, please. Well, in this setting where you're doing it at the time of the total thyroidectomy, the nerve is skeletonized. Uh, if you're not going to do it, there's uh, a large portion of the nerve that's not usually exposed and dissected. Uh, in a case where you're doing a comprehensive ipsilateral dissection, then the nerve is going to be skeletonized so that uh, the lymph node packet, lateral, medial, uh, to the nerve as well as a pretracheal, the, the central portion uh, of the prelaryngeal and pretracheal nodes are also dissected. Uh, they're not always kept in continuity, just given their uh, orientation, but uh, it's a comprehensive dissection where the nerve is dissected uh, in its entirety down to the level of the anominate artery from the cricoid insertion point. And that sounds like a, a Lisa, definition that I'm comfortable thing? with. So this lesion was on the right side, and I think it's, yes. it bears mentioning that the recurrent laryngeal nerve on the right um, d uh, divides the central compartment in a way different from the left, and that there's a substantial nodal packet posterior deep to the uh, recurrent nerve on the right side. So um, it doesn't disagree with what Bob just described, but there is a, a larger volume of nodal disease posterior and lateral to the, to the nerve. Um, I, uh, I think otherwise, you know, it's the management of the parathyroids is the real challenge in these central compartments. And so it, to some extent, depends on where those parathyroids were and how their blood supply was oriented at the time of the thyroidectomy. I typically would do the thyroidectomy first and do the central compartment dissection after removing the thyroid. So it's, there's some variation to it. So, I mean, one of the reasons that I bring this case up again is to emphasize the difference in mindset between surgeons and endocrinologists, um, because we tend to think as endocrinologists very simplistically that you either operate and dissect those, uh, those compartments in the central area or you ignore them altogether. And I think the subtleties are often lost on us. And I think it's those subtleties that lead to some of these very heated debates about how we should actually manage the central neck. When you really sit down with at least the surgeons at Moffat and you talk through exactly what they do, just as you described, it's actually exactly the same at Moffat as at Mayo and I suspect as it is at Memorial. Uh, these uh, terms that we use are used loosely and don't really describe what the surgeons truly do. Um, so I would make a plea for clearer language and uh, you know, uh, clarity of communication back to the endocrinologists who get upset with you if you don't do something in the central neck. Would it change your management of central neck if it was BRAF positive? No. We've kind of answered that question before, but does everybody agree that it shouldn't change your management? Anybody in the audience disagree with that? Do you think BRAF is really important in managing the central neck? There's one hand up there. One hand, one hand. Use Please, use. First question is, for everybody's central neck they second, where is the fascial plane that divides the right and left central neck? I've never understood that. Good. How do you know how far to go over on the other neck to know that you're staying on one side? That's one question. The other question is, do you guys have any pearls on how to preserve the parathyroids when you're taking all the soft tissue out with all the nodes that look like parathyroids? Sounds like a question for the surgical team. <laughs> Well, I don't do elective dissections because I have not been convinced it has any benefit to the patient. And I was going to ask Lisa and Bob both, what do your patients benefit and how many of them benefit out of the 100 you do? So maybe think about the response to that. The superior parathyroid is easier to preserve because it is tucked away from the lymph, uh, lymph node bearing area. And 
a proper central compartment lymph node dissection means clearance of all lymph nodes from hyoid to innominate and from carotid to carotid. I bet my boots, 80 out of 100 surgeons doing elective central compartment dissections don't do that and challenge me on that one. But what about that definition of left versus right central compartment? Where is the Well, I think it's, it's an arbitrary midline. You, you, you clear pre-tracheal lymph nodes up to the lateral aspect of the lower pole of the contralateral lobe. Is that about correct? Yeah. So you clear pre-tracheal lymph nodes up to, up to the lower pole of the contralateral lobe. But it's an arbitrary line. There is no, no f uh, finite division. Keep also in mind that there is crisscross lymphatic drainage also. Inject dye in one lobe of thyroid and you will harvest it from the contralateral uh, uh, paratracheal area. So it is not strictly unilateral. So uh, one Gary has his high I'm hand sorry. up. Yeah. Gary, take, use the microphone. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So there is going to be a VA cooperative trial uh, that's going to be looking at the elective dissection. Uh, this VA cooperative trial uh, is not powered to look at recurrence. Uh, it's powered to look at morbidity of the surgery. They defined uh, the neck dissection as stopping at the contralateral thymus. I think that was as arbitrary as anything else. There is no fascial plane there. Actually, when you showed that one ultrasound, there's a posterior carotid lymph node there that's more than one centimeter in size. Uh, would not be removed in a standard central compartment dissection, just as no. So um, not only were lymph nodes in the central compartment involved, this tumor was also BRAF positive, but also when the surgeon went in, it was clinically adherent or invasive into the trachea. Um, so this is where head and neck surgeons excel, is doing stuff to the, uh, to the viscera of the neck. So what is the appropriate management of tracheal adherence versus invasion? Anyone who wants to volunteer, please. <laughs> Well, I can tell you what, what it sounds like would happen in my practice is if this were discovered intraoperatively, uh, then attempts would be made to obtain a negative margin uh, on the cartilage uh, to the extent that even a ring could potentially be shaved. Uh, but this is where frozen section would be useful. Uh, I think uh, in the absence of having a uh, thorough discussion and a plan, I would not be more extensive than that uh, at this stage. So you would not propose to uh, reset part of the trachea or do anything more aggressive uh, with this disease? You would just shave it down to a negative surgical margin? How far will you shave it? Right into the lumen? Well, that is occasionally what happens and uh, requires uh, buttressing that and supporting that with uh, strap muscle or some other maneuvers, but hopefully avoidance. Okay. And the rest of the panelists agree with that approach? We haven't really talked about imaging, preoperative imaging, but I think the best management of tracheal invasion is to anticipate it and really be thinking about it before you get to the operating room. So if you have any suspicion of that, uh, of its presence, getting cross-sectional imaging is appropriate preoperatively and performing bronchoscopy at the time of intubation to assess for intraluminal disease is, is also very valuable. It's very difficult once you've already resected the thyroid and, and haven't really assessed the depth of invasion from the inside out or cross-sectional. Which raises a crucially important question. When should we be doing cross-sectional imaging in the preoperative neck and should we be doing it with CAT scan or MRI or some other imaging and should we, if we're using CAT scan, do it with contrast material? So let's uh, have a little discussion about that. So if you are going to do a CAT scan, don't waste your time and money doing a non-contrast CAT scan. It's totally useless. And giving contrast dye and getting better imaging to give you better assessment of the central compartment viscera and the tumor is the crucial part. No inadequate operation is going to be patched off by RAI. So only administration of contrast to do a CAT scan implies that your radio and administration would be delayed by a few weeks, maybe two months even. I'm not aware of any patient ever even reported as a case report who has died because of delay in RAI administration by two months. 
And as an endocrinologist, I would support your view on that 100%. You know, it doesn't take that long for the uh, iodine load to be washed out. We typically would check urinary iodine excretion rates to confirm that the iodine load is gone and then move ahead with RAI if that's indicated. But how about... Um, so, Brian, you indicated adherence versus invasion. Yes. Ad adherence to me implies that you can peel the tumor off the trachea. Invasion to me implies you need to investigate more by imaging, by endoscopy, and be prepared for visceral dissection. So I agree with that, but then the question is, who should be submitted to cross-sectional imaging preoperatively? So is this something your, we do to every patient or not? Go back to your ultrasound. Can you show the imaging yep. back? Okay, there we go. so if you see here, you do not see any intraluminal tumor, but you do have concern about the irregularity of the tracheal wall on the right-hand side. I would be inclined to do cross-sectional imaging on this. Keep in mind, you don't have to have intraluminal tumor to have full thickness tracheal wall invasion. The tracheal wall may look smooth on ultrasound or on cross-sectional imaging, but simple hypervascularity of the mucosa of the trachea and fixation of the tumor to the tracheal wall is tracheal invasion. That tumor you will not be able to peel off. You will actually transact the tumor trying to peel it off. So endoscopic assessment of the trachea to see the area of hypervascularity or telangiectasia is a crucial point which will tell you that the tumor is just next to the trachea or it infiltrates the tracheal wall. So you would uh, recommend CT with contrast to evaluate this neck preoperatively? Absolutely. Um, is that the case in Kobe as well? Would you do cross-sectional imaging with contrast material? Uh, yes, preoperatively. I checked the uh, CT scan, so okay. uh, contrast. All right, and, and no in good. Emory, you would also cross-sectionally image? Yeah, at times we try to do MRI pre-op, but eventually we end up doing the CT with contrast because you still end up with the same problem of we can't identify the planes, we don't know which one is lymph node and what is blood vessel and things like that. So, so again, the question would be to the panel, is this something we should recommend in everybody going through thyroid surgery now or should we be selective? And if we're going to be selective, what criteria should we use to select a patient for cross-sectional imaging pre-op? Dr. Shah has suggested because we're not really seeing the, medi the, the lateral wall of the trachea, medial to this tumor, maybe that's an indication. Should we base it on that? Should we base it on size? How are we going to make this determination? Because once again, I'll point out ATA guidelines, ACE guidelines, and I think AES guidelines, none of them call for routine cross-sectional imaging. No. So I've been privileged to be part of a, a writing group from the um, <laughs> ATA that is about to publish, and Bob is as well, a, a guidelines on preoperative imaging in thyroid cancer. And most of the focus of this uh, writing project was on uh, nodal disease and uh, disease that appears to extend beyond the thyroid, not really focusing on characteristics of thyroid nodules uh, within the thyroid. But I think a, a sort of simple summary is that if you are not confident that you can see everything that might be there to see with ultrasound alone, um, then cross-sectional imaging is complementary. So it may be the disease that uh, appears to extend beyond your ultrasound limit, and it may be that the patient's body habitus or, um, or prior um, treatment, uh, thyroid-related or unrelated, in the neck um, distorts anatomy such that you just you can't see completely around the disease, then it's appropriate to do cross-sectional imaging. So again, I think the message to the endocrinologists would be, you know, be more liberal with your cross-sectional imaging uh, rather than just relying on ultrasound. Sorry, a question at the microphone, if you will. Um, Hisham Mahana from uh, Birmingham. I guess what, what our discussion is saying is that um, what Bob alluded to earlier is that really it's the quality of your ultrasound that's pretty important. And that, uh, you know, we often get uh, radiographers and, and community ultrasound uh, operators doing these regular ultrasounds and it really has to be somebody who's very um, experienced at doing ultrasound uh, radiography or, or, or else you get bitten by these basically. Absolutely, 100% agree with that. 
All right, so let's, since we're running uh, remarkably short of time, let's uh, move on to this case, case number three. She is a 28-year-old woman. You can see the problem there in her neck. It's been present for a few months and treated with antibiotics to no benefit. It's felt to be about four and a half centimeters in the right lateral neck, and that was confirmed on ultrasound. Um, ultrasound otherwise was reported to be negative. There was nothing in the thyroid gland visible. CT scan was otherwise negative, apart from a mass in the right uh, region two, and a core biopsy was performed elsewhere and was positive for papillary thyroid cancer. So this uh, sounds like it's the old-fashioned lateral aberrant thyroid. Since we're 100 years into the uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering Head and Neck Surgical Service, uh, Dr. Shah, how often do you see lateral aberrant thyroid at Memorial? That's a misnomer, and uh, I think that terminology should be removed from the uh, vocabulary for thyroid surgeons. Uh, literally, every patient who was described to have lateral aberrant thyroid was indeed a metastatic papillary carcinoma, completely replacing the lymph node where the tumor was so well differentiated and there was no lymphoid follicle seen that it looked like normal thyroid tissue. Incidentally, the picture you showed is not the location for lateral aberrant thyroid. Lateral aberrant thyroids occur in, at level four or in the supraclavicular fossa. That's where they were called lateral aberrant thyroids. Higher up in the neck, they are clearly metastatic thyroid carcinomas. Nevertheless, the terminology lateral aberrant thyroid is equal to well-differentiated carcinoma metastatic to a lymph node. So in 2014, there is no lateral aberrant thyroid. And, so I would agree Sean, with that. And I gather, at least my interpretation of that concept of the lateral aberrant thyroid was much more of an incidental observation than a clinically apparent, what's obviously a metastatic node anyway. It was removing lymph nodes and finding benign appearing thyroid tissue in an incidental sort of fashion, as opposed to somebody presenting clinically like this that isn't even the phenotype of a lateral aberrant thyroid. All right. I think those are fair criticisms of a term that we shouldn't be using anymore anyway, but uh, sometimes it's fun to go back to the old history books. So how should we manage the thyroid gland? How should we manage the lateral neck on that side? And what should we do about the central neck in this case, where the thyroid gland itself is ultrasonographically normal? Is there any family history or radiation exposure? No family history, no radiation exposure, and her TSH was 0.9. Um, so this patient would get uh, a uh, ultrasound, both of the central and lateral neck. Uh, this is a patient that I will often get both uh, CT, uh, contrasted CT, as well as a good ultrasound, clearly repeating it at my center. Uh, so so just to reassure you, the ultrasound was done at a cancer center and was negative apart from this big lateral neck mass, and the CT scan also was reviewed from the outside, was felt to be of adequate quality, so was not repeated, but the review also suggested a solitary mass in the right high neck. So uh, as has been pointed out, she still has quite a good prognosis. She's probably very worried, but uh, she has a big operation in front of her. Uh, she needs a total thyroidectomy. In my practice, I would do an ipsilateral uh, central compartment dissection as well as a lateral comprehensive neck dissection, levels two through five. I so would you, would, you would do the, the uh, transverse incision and turn the corner and go all the way up to the back of the ear? I would carry a, a coker incision laterally uh, in a skin crease uh, that's less obtrusive, if you will. Uh, I so tell me about the pros and cons, if you will, of the extended coker incision versus a true lateral neck incision running along the, uh, the uh, lateral border of the sternocleidomastoid or medial border of sternocleidomastoid. Well, uh, I tend to make for squamous cell carcinomas a hockey stick type incision vertically behind the sternocleidomastoid. It's relatively unobtrusive, but in a patient like this, uh, you can usually get around all of those lymph nodes with a single low incision uh, in, a, uh, in a horizontal plane, extending that coker incision, even if you extend it posterior to the sternocleidomastoid muscle a bit for more superior exposure. Because that looked like a level two node, at least a four and a half centimeter, some portion is gonna be up in level two, 2A. Two I think you're obligated to dissect level 2B uh, on this young woman as well. Of course, you have to be careful with the, the uh, accessory nerve. That's the major concern. Uh, 
uh, but level five is going to be, uh, I think, of necessity as well. And so extending the coker more posteriorly gives you access to level uh, 5A and B. And uh, any other takers for an extended coker incision? Does everybody agree that that's an appropriate uh, incision to reach this level two lymph node high in the neck and clear the remainder of compartments two, three, four, five, and six, at least ipsilateral? It is not. <laughs> Good. Why not? Uh, in 2004, the only incision for any type of neck dissection is a single transverse incision along a appropriate skin crease, regardless of the indication for the neck dissection. All you have to do is extend the length of the incision along the same skin crease, whether it's higher or lower, such that you should not be able to identify the neck incision in that patient standing six feet away, regardless of what neck dissection you have done. Coker incision is out of the uh, vocabulary for modern day teaching in head and neck surgery. Double trifurcate incision is out of the vocabulary. And any incision that draws a vertical component in the neck is out of the vocabulary for head and neck surgery. Out of the vocabulary for head and neck surgery, not only for thyroid surgery. That is correct. Ooh, those are fighting words, I feel sure. Yeah. We have a squamous panel after this. Yes. Squ squamous <laughs> carcinoma, adenocarcinoma, skin cancer, or thyroid cancer. I think what you were describing is actually what Dr. Ferris does, but maybe calls it a coker incision out, in, you know, you know, out of maybe uh, I think tradition. Um, I think another name that's sometimes used is the Addy decision or Addy incision after uh, Joseph Addy. But uh, I. I agree that you can access all of those levels of the neck through extension of your thyroidectomy incision. I Maybe not calling it a coker incision, but designing the level of the incision to be able to uh, adequately access the superior aspects of the central compartment and the thyroid, as well as yep. the inferior aspects of the central neck, and just being able to extend that laterally. So where for the hockey stick incision? Where does that come in? Is there a role for a hockey stick incision in California? Uh, you know, I think in this case, dissecting level one, um, at least in my practice, uh, is not uh, a component that I spend a lot of time with. I think it's uh, likely to be the area of most difficulty uh, without uh, a vertical portion. Uh, so I would say in that situation that it's uh, when you're focused in the aerodigestive tract as opposed to level uh, six and four where most of the lymph nodes metastatic from thyroid cancer are. Uh, that to me is where I distinguish the need for different incisions. And many more of these patients uh, are young females where a less obtrusive scar is important. Uh, you know, it's a disease of morbidity as opposed to mortality, as opposed to squamous cell carcinoma where uh, getting all of the disease out uh, is obviously much more of a, uh, a mortality issue. So let me then turn to the audience because again, I think there's some controversy potentially here. Um, who amongst the audience agree that the vertical component of an incision, call it what you will, but the thing that runs up behind the ear has gone out of the practice of head and neck surgery? Is there anybody here? So let me rephrase the question. I apologize. Let me make it clear. Is there anybody here who still feels that the vertical component of the incision is a requirement or a desirable attribute of a surgical approach? So we do still have some uh, outstanding people. Is, what are we talking about? I think you need to rephrase that question for for cancer. for thyroid cancer. I should make it clear. Okay, let's try again. Vertical incision for metastatic thyroid cancer involving lymph nodes. Is there anybody who would still do that vertical incision? Wave your hands if you're raising them. There's a few smattered people. Yes, and presumably this is for ease of access to the upper part of the neck. Um, how about morbidity of the vertical versus the skin crease incision? Is there a difference in morbidity in terms of neurologic function in the neck? It's not the morbidity, Brian, but it's the aesthetic morbidity. I, I the, count that as morbidity. Yeah, the functional morbidity of numbness of the skin is going to be the same. But the aesthetic morbidity of putting a hypertrophic scar in a woman's neck, or a man's neck for that matter, is not, not called for because you can essentially do everything, including level 2B and 1A, through a single transverse incision. Bob, try it. Next time you will give me a call after the operation, 
Jay, you were right, I could do it. <laughs> All right, so pathology on this case revealed a T1A. Uh, there was a tiny microscopic focus, a three millimeter focus of papillary cancer. N1B, a single lymph node involved, no extra nodal extension. Despite the size of that thing, there was not felt to be soft tissue invasion. Um, how about adjuvant therapy? Is this somebody who should receive radioactive iodine? How about in Emory? Yeah, so this is a patient now with relatively small primary, but already you have evidence of um, node involvement. Um, so this would be at least intermediate risk. So we'll benefit from adjuvant iodine therapy. You said that very confidently, will benefit. The data well, that supports you? <laughs> well, that is, that is the slippery slope there now to say we'll benefit. So I, I, let me retrace my step. Um, I will recommend the patient to receive adjuvant therapy for two reasons. One, given the nodal involvement, we know that the risk of recurrence in this patient is going to be higher than if you did not have lymph node involvement. Therefore, you want to closely monitor this patient in a reliable manner. So using iodine therapy at least as, not just as, as adjuvant, but to allow you to better monitor the patient in terms of thyroglobulin measurement will be of benefit. So what if the post-operative thyroglobulin is not measurable? Would you still give RAI? If the post-op yeah. thyroglobulin... Six weeks after the operation, yes. the thyroglobulin is not measurable and there are no antibodies. TG is less than 0.2 negative antibodies. Well, at least the data out there will suggest that we know that pre-op thyroglobulin doesn't actually tell you what the survival no. outcome is going to be. Uh, the drop in thyroglobulin post-surgery also has not been shown to be a strong predictor of what the outcome is going to be. It may be that you have a tumor that is actually not thyroglobulin secreting, and then the question becomes what would be the benefit of your iodine therapy in that right. instance. Um, I guess that would be something that you have to discuss with the patient, that using iodine therapy in this instance is probably not going to help in terms of your monitoring. But I know where you're coming from saying, show me the data, that adjuvant therapy will actually help with the outcome for this patient. I think there is some data to suggest that, not strong, uh, a lot of it retrospective, showing that when you give I-131 as adjuvant therapy in this instance, it doesn't improve your overall survival, but it may at least reduce the risk of recurrence, which is what most of these patients will suffer from. So I'll show my stripes at this point and emphasize that I'm a, a therapeutic minimalist when it comes to the use of radioactive iodine, having spent almost 20 years at Mayo Clinic under the tutelage of Ian Hay. So I come at this from a biased perspective. Um, the data from Mayo, and we look very, very carefully at these patients, the data from Mayo is that node positive or node negative, uh, size of tumor irrespective, so long as the patient was truly stage one and low risk by the prognostic scoring system of MASIS, AGES, or AIMS, that we were unable to demonstrate any benefit to I-131 ablative therapies in, any, in these patients. And the two groups had superimposable uh, mortality rates and recurrence rates. Um, and those data we've presented on a number of occasions. Having said that, there are others around the country who strongly disagree with us. Um, it is the source of continuing uh, exciting interactions at various national and international meetings. And of course, moving to a cancer center as I have in Tampa, I've had to somewhat compromise my principles and acknowledge that most of my colleagues would be very uncomfortable not treating a patient like this with I-131. So my bias then is to do it in a way that if we're going to do it, minimizes the morbidity of the treatment and use low dose remnant ablation using thyrogen stimulation to avoid hypothyroidism and use uh, low doses of I-131, which are dem demonstrated to provide equally effective uh, ablation of the thyroid remnant, which is all you're really achieving by doing this I-131. But could I get a comment uh, from the Japanese perspective Radioactive iodine, I understand, is less commonly used in Japan. Would you take an approach that involved RAI or not? Uh, there is no, re uh, <clears throat> there is no uh, merit to uh, radioactive iodine, 
but uh, recurrent and uh, distant metastasis in the future uh, is high, I think. So um, I <laughs> recommend uh, radioactive uh, iodine therapy. You would administer radioactive iodine? But I, check, I will check uh, the cyroglobulin, the level of cyroglobulin. Yeah. So it's high, I strongly yeah. recommend. So I think that one very strong argument in favor of some exposure to radioactive iodine in this patient is the search for distant metastatic spread. We've currently classified her as an MX, but we have no chest imaging. We haven't done a CT scan of the chest. Uh, it's quite helpful, I think, sometimes to do low-dose RAI and do a post-therapy scan to give yourself that extra level of reassurance that the chest is clear. I haven't found that to be a big issue with the N1B, just one or two lymph nodes, but if you have bulky lymphadenopathy extensively through the neck, I think that's a different beast. Brian, you have been in the thyroid cancer business long enough. In this setting of this patient, how often have you found distant metastasis by RAI scan? Never. So I'm, I think we need to clarify that. I'm trying to be nice. Is Mike Tuttle in the audience? Michael? No. no. So our, our data of RAI mimics or reflects exactly what the Mayo Clinic uh, showed, that administration of RAI postoperatively did not make any difference in local regional recurrence, recurrence pre survival, or overall survival, whether they were treated or not. So our current philosophy is we do not give radioactive iodine unless the operative findings or the pathology report indicates an aggressive cancer or the patient who is at low risk has persistently elevated thyroglobulin postoperatively, done it, done it about six weeks out, indicating that there may be a small node that we did not clear and that may need RAI treatment. And uh, certainly you're singing to the choir because that has always been my perspective as well. But I do find that the art of compromise is an important art to practice, which is why occasionally I will treat some of these folks nowadays with radioactive iodine that I would not have in the past, recognizing that we can do it with negligible risk. I think we need a trial. So we have enough time, I think, to deal with case four, um, if we're prompt about it. It's a 68-year-old man, sudden onset of dysphonia and hoarseness following three months of progressive discomfort on swallowing and then more recently a little dysphagia. Uh, he has a large right neck mass palpated in the neck with tracheal deviation to the contralateral side, and laryngoscopy reveals a right vocal cord paralysis. There's no stridor clinically. Um, imaging in this case, I presume everyone would want some kind of cross-sectional imaging. Uh, CT with contrast. Anybody who wants a PET scan at this early stage? What are we getting out of our imaging? Dr. Orloff, what's the purpose of that CT versus the PET? Well, your primary goal is to control the local disease, so the imaging is more focused on the um, uh, surgical decision-making and, and executing adequate surgery. So a PET scan is perhaps premature. Um, it, but you know uh, this is a cancer, right? I mean, this is not uh, going to be benign. This, Good luck getting it approved. You well, don't have a diagnosis. that's true. So uh, CT with contrast, I, I would say that... Um, it really varies by institution, but MRI with contrast is also uh, reasonable. I think there's probably a, a majority of people who favor CT. I have um, personally had uh, a lot of um, preference for MRI by my neuroradiologists and by just the goal of minimizing radiation exposure, but I think either, either type of study is appropriate. Um, and it needs to be performed to include the mediastinum as well as the neck. So when you order a CT scan of the neck, you will often have the tumor cut off at the level of the clavicles. And so <laughs> I think it's really important to emphasize um, CT from the skull base to the medias to and including the mediastinum. Um, CT scans, I've been taught by my, neuro my radiology colleagues, when a CT scan of the neck is done with the patient's arms down at their side, whereas a CT scan of the chest is done with their arms up over their head, so it does change the relationship of the anatomy. So it just, it just helps to know your regional protocol for imaging and to request that the scan go down uh, below the clavicles. Um, but as you're showing here, I mean, you, you are looking for uh, where this tumor is invading. You already know that there's some invasive component because of the vocal fold paralysis, but, uh, 
uh, looking up and down from there um, to include the relationship with the trachea, the esophagus, the larynx, the retropharynx, and uh, the mediastinum, as well as the, the great vessels. So I've picked just one cross-sectional uh, image of this tumor mass, which I think is evident there. You can see this big mass kind of invading posteriorly, heading at least towards the vertebral fascia. Um, it appears to be involving the trachea at multiple levels, and although we're not seeing a good view of the esophagus there, the read was that we probably had esophageal invasion of this tumor as well. Um, so there was a PET scan done as part of uh, staging for more distant metastases uh, before this patient could be sent to the OR, and I'll explain the background to that in a moment. But you can see that this is very highly PET avid, as you might expect for presumably a poorly differentiated version of thyroid cancer. I would just make one uh, comment about that, and that is that not all large and invasive cancers are necessarily poorly differentiated. And I think it's important to make a distinction between an aggressive cancer, which I believe this one actually is, poorly differentiated, deeply invasive, non-iodine avid, not a very effective thyroglobulin producer probably, versus cancer that's just been sitting there for a long time and has had a long incubation period to become more locally advanced. I think there's a, a difference between those two things. But in this case, the time course, the invasion, the loss of the recurrent laryngeal nerve, the size of the tumor, and its invasive characteristics all suggest it's probably poorly differentiated thyroid cancer. A biopsy is performed which reveals follicular neoplasm. Uh, anybody still want to do uh, molecular markers on that? Uh, UPMC, would you do molecular markers on this follicular neoplasm? It's a reflexive test for any indeterminate nodule, so we would have this automatically. And how helpful is that going to be at the cost of how many thousand dollars? Uh, it, you know, it's been analyzed as a cost-effective test since we use it with a high positive predictive value to avoid the lobectomy and second surgery. But aren't you going to have to take this, this guy to the OR? Yeah. yeah. Well, this case is not, I mean, the cytology is inaccurate. It's not a follicular neoplasm. So if the cytology hit the appropriate malignant area of the tumor, you know, you, we would not do a molecular test. So this is one of the quirks where the reflexive test probably does it. Uh, on the other hand, it would likely be BRAF positive, and so we would have our diagnosis that we know. I think in this case, y you want to make sure uh, that you get uh, excised tissue and not rely on cytologic tissue, honestly, because you want to know what the um, differentiation status is of this very likely, you know, malignancy. Well, it's a topic for another day, but I think this business of re reflexing tests is one that should be open to some additional discussion. I know it's very popular in the commercial field right now to simply take cytology that's indeterminate and reflex it. But I think, uh, as this case demonstrates, we already know this is a cancer. Um, I'm not convinced that a, reflex, a reflex test makes a lot of sense, whether it was the Affirma assay, the UPMC assay, uh, a surgeon's version of this, you know, whatever it is, I think it's evident that the molecular markers, unless you think BRAF is useful, the molecular markers probably aren't all that helpful. Right. But what would be the surgical approach? How are we going to manage this big, nasty, invasive cancer in this man who's lost a vocal cord already? Dr. Shah. Carefully. <laughs> Did everybody hear that? He said carefully. <laughs> uh, I think, you know, you need to sort out what is the level of understanding of the patient and the patient's willingness to have the type of surgery he may need. And that will allow you to decide whether you want to do a two-stage operation or one stage. And when I say two-stage, meaning endoscopic assessment to define what you will have to do and have the patient mentally prepared for that. Or if the patient is ready, doctor, do whatever is necessary, cure me of my cancer, that makes your job easier and you can do everything at one time. After imaging, the, this patient needs careful endoscopy of the trachea and the esophagus. You, you would probably find tracheal invasion through the mucosa on the right-hand side, where you saw the irregular uh, tracheal wall. At esophagoscopy, what you want to see more carefully, you may not see intraluminal tumor, but you want to see whether the mucosa easily glides over the involved muscular wall or not. And that would help you decide whether you need to do through and through esophagectomy or build resection of only muscular wall, 
uh, be adequate, leaving the mucosa and therefore the lumen in intact. So endoscopic assessment is crucial uh, before you put the incision. So it turns out that prior to uh, going through that procedure, the patient acknowledged a little hemoptysis uh, over a couple of days. Yeah. And um, at the time of bronchoscopy, uh, there was indeed through and through tracheal invasion with uh, disease visible in the lumen right. of the So trachea. at that point, you need to be uh, careful as to what is the length of invasion of the trachea that you may have to resect. You can easily resect and do primary uh, repair or primary anastomosis up to six or even seven rings of trachea, but it depends upon the the physiognomy of the patient, long neck, short neck, et cetera. Yes, but that's, those are technical issues. In most instances, the vertical involvement of the tracheal wall is within reach of the surgeon to be able to accomplish primary anastomosis. So this was a man who had been a heavy smoker for much of his life. He had a hyperinflated chest, a rather short and bulky neck. Um, he had imaging that suggested uh, at least a four centimeter length of invasion into the tracheal wall and intraluminally there was at least three centimeters of tumor visible. Yeah. Uh, in addition, when the esophagoscopy was performed, there was also frank invasion of the esophageal wall. Um, mucosal wall of the esophagus. Mucosal wall, correct. So in this setting, now you are committing yourself to a much bigger operation, which may mean laryngotracheal resection and esophagectomy. And in that setting, I want to have the histology confirmed. I won't do that on follicular invasion or follicular lesion. So I would be inclined to do after endoscopies either an open biopsy frozen section, or if I have staged my endoscopies, then I want a core biopsy to give me a more clear histologic diagnosis. So a core biopsy was performed of the primary lesion and it turned out to be a poorly differentiated follic uh, follicular thyroid cancer. So when it's you get that type. diagnosis, now you need to go to the pathology lab because that to me is not enough. I want the pathologist to tell me, are you seeing this tumor leaning towards an aplastic carcinoma or this is poorly differentiated carcinoma leaning towards differentiated carcinoma with focal areas of anaplasia, because that will make the difference. If truly this is a poorly differentiated carcinoma with anaplastic features, the probability of surgical cure, mind you, my word, cure becomes less and less. Surgical control of neck disease is possible, but surgical cure for anaplastic carcinoma is unlikely. So the pathologist is adamant that they do not see any signs of anaplastic thyroid cancer. This is poorly differentiated cancer, and that's all they see in this core biopsy, but they could not exclude the possibility of having anaplastic cancer elsewhere that has not been sampled at this point. Okay. So um, other surgical views on this. Is this a surgically uh, approachable disease? I'd be looking for reasons not to do surgery on this patient. I think Don't you have lots of them? Very unlikely to cure this individual if there's true uh, invasion of the laryng laryngotracheal structure. So I would want to get a CT scan higher. I didn't quite see the cricoid and the larynx. Uh, but uh, 68 years old, the patient, uh, if fit, could certainly tolerate uh, a major procedure. It's just clearly the best curative chance, but you're going to have to reconstruct both uh, the uh, laryngotracheal complex uh, with pull-up type procedures, microvascular procedures. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a major problem that you'd want to make sure the, the distant disease, I gather the PET has been already cleared, but I think from the local regional uh, standpoint, surgery would be uh, not advised. So uh, just in the last few minutes, is there a role for a neoadjuvant approach um, to the management of these deeply invasive and uh, n rather nasty, poorly differentiated cancers? Could we give a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, for example, and, and shrink this cancer down, make it more easily operable? Yeah, I think the points that have already been raised is very critical because we need to know whether truly this is anaplastic thyroid cancer or poorly differentiated variant of well differentiated thyroid cancer. And the reason for saying that is even when we are talking of neoadjuvant approach, that presupposes we are thinking of going back to surgery at one point or the other. If this is truly anaplastic, 
Then the use of cytotoxic chemotherapy as a new adjuvant approach has been shown to be equivalent to doing adjuvant chemotherapy after debulking surgery. So if we think this is anaplastic and the surgeons have already decided this is not something we want to jump into, at that point it would be reasonable to use a platinum-based uh, chemotherapy regimen as an, as an either new adjuvant approach along with radiation. Uh, I know some surgeons don't want the radiation in the mix. Um, or if it is a poorly differentiated follicular neoplasm, then one can then consider the use of tyrosine kinase inhibitors. But I think in that regard, the ability to actually shrink the tumor is relatively less. And therefore, you will not be looking at that as, an, as a new adjuvant intervention with the plan of going to surgery. So just to wrap this case up, the patient actually made the decision for us. He was not interested in accepting the aggressive surgical approach with loss of voice and the chance of loss of swallowing that that might ensue. And he elected for a uh, chemo radiation program with cisplatin-based chemotherapy and uh, external beam radiation, which I think completed about a week ago. So I can update this conference next year and let you know how he's doing. I'd like to thank the panelists for an interesting and fascinating discussion. I'd like to thank the audience for attention. Good job. I appreciate it very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.